Hello students. In this class, I am going to start a new chapter that is management and administration, which is chapter number seven of Companies Act 2013. So far, we discussed uh, six chapters in Companies Act 2013. You now just look at them once. So chapter number one, preliminary. In preliminary, we covered all the basics of the company and we discussed various types of the companies: holding, subsidiary, listed, unlisted, company limited by guarantee, company limited by shares, unlimited companies small companies, foreign companies, body corporate, right? And in second chapter, you know, incorporation of companies and matters incidental thereto, we discussed how to incorporate a company. Next chapter, you know, prospectus and allotment of securities, you know, today for every company for carrying business operations, it requires money. And if a company wants to offer securities to public at a large for getting money, so what is the procedure for making public offer and what is the procedure for making allotment of securities these procedures we discussed under prospectus and allotment of securities so next you know chapter number four share capital and debentures you know we discussed various types of issues you know issue of equity shares with the differential rights issue of bonus shares issue of uh, uh, shares to the existing members on proportionate basis next we discussed preference shares debentures reduction of share capital buyback of equity shares and we covered transfer and transmission of securities also a very big chapter but simple chapter next one you know in order to meet a small term requirements short term requirements in order to meet short term requirements of medium finance medium term finance you know company may accept deposits from eligible candidates so provisions related to acceptance of deposits we discussed under chapter number 5 of companies act 2013 so next one registration of charges you know if a company creates charge on its assets in favor of uh, any person for getting finance so such charges should be registered with roc so chapter number six now chapter number seven management and administration in this chapter we are going to discuss you know how the company is getting managed and how the company is getting administered why because you know company is an artificial person so its existence, its birth, its death, everything is decided by operation of law. Yes or no? And you know the provisions of management and administration gained importance only because of one small concept that is separate legal entity. The characteristic of company, one of the characteristics of the company is separate legal entity. So here you can observe, you know, a company is a legal body and it is separated from its uh, members. So who are the members of company simply you know who is, what is the relationship between company and member the relationship is members are simply owners of the company owners of the company so company will do business and for doing this business whatever money is required you know the members will contribute so members will contribute funds to the company for doing business operations as you all know company is an artificial person it can't do things on its own so definitely it requires a human agency that's what you know company will appoint directors so company's agent is simply nothing but you know board of directors who comes under management management now just look at this picture so what is the role of members in the company sir they are owners they will contribute money to the company for doing business so company will do business with the funds contributed by the members and what is the role of directors in the company sir simply they are agents to the company they will carry all business operations on behalf of the company now i'm asking you my dear students just answer my question just a small question you are having a 1 lakh rupee and you invested entire 1 lakh rupee in the equity shares of reliance industry limited now just tell me will you check uh, your investment portfolio on periodical basis yes or no if you are new to the stock market, you know, you will definitely verify your investment portfolio hourly once. And if you are a regular investor, at least, you know, daily once you will check your investment portfolio, whether, you know, if uh, share prices are increasing, definitely your portfolio will be in profits. If share prices are getting declined, then your portfolio will be in losses. So for knowing your position, definitely, you know, you'll open DMAT account and you will observe the uh, changes in your investment portfolios. Yes or no? Now, just come to the company, you know, come to the members concept. So these people are contributing money whenever company required funds. Now, definitely they will also show some concern. So they will also will have some concern, you know, whether company is doing business uh, in a profits or in losses. 
So what is the performance of the company? Is it uh, having a good profits or is it suffering with losses? Loss to company, it is nothing but loss to the owners only. Profits to the company, definitely members will get share in the profits in the form of dividends. So that what's, you know, you, every member of the company, you know, he will show some concern with to the company. However, he can't participate in day-to-day -day efforts of the company because, you know, separate legal entity, company is separated, owners are separated. So owners will not participate in day-to-day -day efforts of the company. So who will carry operations, you know, board of directors on behalf of company, they will do business. So now member is thinking, you know, what is the performance of the company? We need to review the performance of the company. Is it in profits or losses? You are getting my point. So you may tell me that, you know, you, you will definitely answer this question. So how can you provide solution to this, uh, uh, you know, in this situation? So members want to know uh, performance of the company. You know, what is the solution available with you? So you may tell me that, sir, no problem, sir. So company will prepare financial statements on periodical basis. No, sir, you know, every year, every year company will prepare uh, financial statements, right? So ask a company to circulate financial statements among the members of the company. Yeah, good answer. But I'm asking you, do you think every member of the company, do you think every member of the company will have a sufficient knowledge with respect to Schedule 3 of Companies Act 2013? No, not every person. Okay, okay, suppose assume that each and every person is having a sufficient knowledge with respect to Schedule 3 of Companies Act 2013, I agree. But the point is, the financial statements will not only contain actual figures, it will also contain estimates. You didn't get it right. Suppose if you look at the sales purchases, they are actual figures, actual figures. But coming to the closing stock, you know, inventory. So as per accounting standard two, inventory should be valued at cost or net realizable value, whichever is lower. So net realizable value is an estimate, you know, at current situation, sorry, in the current situation, at what price we can sell the goods. This is an assumption. This is an estimate. So now cost or NRV, whichever is lower, NRV is an estimate. Or just look at the fixed assets. The cost of fixed assets is an actual figure. But depreciation, you know, you are deducting depreciation every year. The depreciation, is it an actual figure or estimate? Estimate. Debtors, sundry debtors, actual figure. Provision for bad debts, estimate. So like this, you know, financial statements is a combination of actual figures and estimates. Are you getting my point? And these estimates will definitely pay, play a crucial role in deciding, you know, in determining the profitability of the company, whether company is in profits or not. Is it clear? And moreover, just I, I will show you, uh, I will draw a dummy balance sheet for your understanding. Just, uh, just look at this balance, just look at this, uh, you know, profit and loss statement, ma. statement of profit and loss. Statement of profit and loss. So particulars. Amount, you know, 2022-23 current year and, you know, 2021-22 previous year. So turnover previous year, it is 100 crores. Current year, it is 150 crores. Expenses previous year, it is 80 crores. So net profit of previous year is 20 crores. Expenses for the current year, expenses for the current year, it is, uh, mm, 127 end of crores and profit is 22 end of crores profit is okay i'll do one thing no expenses 188 128 crores ma and net profit is just 22 crores just 22 crores observe this statement of profit and loss ma just observe this statement of profit and loss so you'll you'll definitely get a doubt the doubt is the turnover compared to previous year, there is a 50% increment, sir. You know, 50% turnover got increased by 50%. Whereas net profit in absolute terms increased, sir. Last year 20 crores, now it is 22 increase. But you know, only 10% increase I can observe. Turnover increased by 50%, whereas net profit got increased by 10% only. No, absolute figures 150, 100, 20, 20, you know, in absolute figures there is increase. But in terms of uh, percentage, you know, last time turnover got increased by 50%, whereas net profit got increased by 10%. So when you look into the expenses, you know, schedules, schedules of, uh, uh, schedules to the statement of profit and loss, you know, expenditures, only two expenses, research and development. Last year it is just one crore, this year it is almost, you know, nine crores. 
provision for bad debts last year it is just 50 lakhs current year it is almost 5 crores now definitely a member while going through the financial statements he will get a doubt why research and development got increased almost you know 8 times it got increased provision for bad debts 10 times increase why what is the reason so definitely members will get a doubt with respect to some of the figures now it is not possible for the directors of the company to call each and every member or to answer to the calls of each and every member and you know uh, solving the doubts it is not possible why if you take a listed company it will have you know millions of members in ITC almost you know more than 10 lakh members you can observe in Reliance Industry Limited you know 3 million members are there is it advisable to the directors to call each and every member you know asking any doubts in the financial statements not possible so now what we need to do are I ask members to attend for a meeting so that you know the members the owners of the company they will attend to the meeting and they will review the financial performance of the company they will review the operational performance of the company and in case if members are having any doubts you know uh, grievances so directors will redress them grievances are you getting my point so general meetings simply you know meetings invite members for a meeting on an annual basis at least once in a year one time in a year Show them the financial performance of the company. If it is okay to them, if they, are, if they are not having any doubt, ask them to approve the financial statements. Now in the meetings, you know, members who attend the general meetings, they will approve the financial statements. They will adopt the financial statements. Are you getting my point students? Not only, you know, review of financial, re review of financial performance, you can also observe review of director's performance. So we are having a board report director's report ma director's report so along with financial statements you know director's report shall be given to all the members of the company so they will go through the performance of each and every director and if they are okay with the existing directors you know they will uh, reappoint the existing directors if they are not okay with the director's performance you know they will appoint a uh, new persons in the place of uh, retiring directors understood and, and forget about this thing you know right now we completed six chapters in all six chapters if you go through some provisions like you know change of name voluntarily rectification of name change of object clause in MOA next one shifting of register office from one city to another city from one state to another state next one issue of equity shares with differential rights next one issue of preference shares issue of bonus shares issue of debentures acceptance of deposits everywhere you know for company doing this kind of activities company is required to get approval from members and it is not possible to the directors you know calling each and every member sir are you in favor of the uh, decision are you in favor to the resolution or against to the resolution come on tell me your valid vote sir so you are in favor right okay we are uh, we are selecting the option favor you are against to the proposal right we are selecting the against the proposal and it is it is not possible it is not possible because if you take a public company the maximum number of members in a public company is unlimited avoid this confusion simply invite them for a meeting at the meeting you know conduct voting if you get appropriate resolution then the proposal is said to be approved if you fail to get appropriate resolution then the proposal should be dropped it was rejected understood everyone so now let's see ma so is there any time limit for conducting agm you know first of all what is meant by meeting meeting simply you know it's a gathering so how many persons are required for a meeting so minimum two persons are required for a meeting coming to the one person company you know you will find only one member minimum and maximum number of members is just one you can't invite one member for a meeting yes or no so meeting requires minimum two persons that's the reason you know every company other than opc shall conduct a general meeting yearly once okay fine so these meetings are of uh, three types ma meetings related to members no simply general meetings general meetings these general meetings are again of two types ma one is annual general meeting yearly once we, we need to conduct a general meeting agm extraordinary general meeting next one meetings of the directors meetings of the directors now this concept we will discuss at cma final level so in directors you will observe you know board meetings 
board meetings and various committee meetings committees so corporate social responsibility committee audit committee nomination and remuneration committee allotment committee so there are several committees so the meetings of uh, these committees comes under director meetings next one others simply you know creditor meeting debenture holders meetings you know debenture holders meeting we already discussed in debentures uh, chapter you know section 71 next one you know class of shareholders meeting class of shareholders meeting example section 48 section 48 we discussed variation of rights of the uh, class members section 48 so yes a company can issue equity shares of various classes so for suppose normal rights differential rights so company wants to change the terms of differential rights now no need to call for a general meeting just call a differential rights holders for a meeting now this comes under class meeting so others others you know members general meetings we are going to cover under you know chapter number 7 of uh, companies act 2013 that is management and administration section 96 to 122 directors meetings we, we are going to cover at cma final level and coming to the others coming to the others unless aoa otherwise provides simply you know if aoa provides something follow articles of association provisions or else follow the provisions of members meetings only so there is no separate provision there is no separate section for other meetings so simply follow your aoa or follow members meetings 96 to 122 Chalo. so let's begin our discussion with time limit for conducting agm time limit for conducting agm so every company except opc I'm telling you one more time every company except opc is required to have one agm in each and every year company except opc is required to have one general meeting in each and every year and we call them as annual general meetings now this agm is uh, divided into two types one is first annual general meeting next uh, subsequent annual general meeting the first agm means you know agm upon incorporation after incorporation the first general meeting is nothing but first agm and subsequent to first agm every agm we call it as subsequent agm we are having two time limits that's why you know i categorized the agm into two types first agm subsequent agm coming to the first agm the time limit is within nine months from the closure of financial year closure of first financial year here you need to understand what is meant by first financial year closure date what is the first financial year closure date we need to observe so here we are having one more provision to discuss yes first financial year closure date first financial year closure date so here you know company incorporation date is very important ma. company incorporation date if it is incorporated on or after 1st january on or after 1st january then financial year closure date will be 31st march of following year following year other cases other cases 31st march of relevant year relevant financial year here it is the following financial year whereas uh, other cases 31st march of relevant financial year you're getting my point students i'll give you one example see suppose you know company is incorporated on company is incorporated on you know date of incorporation date of incorporation and we'll discuss date of closure of financial year date of closure of financial year first financial year so yes company date of incorporation suppose you know a limited company is there date of incorporation is 30th august 2022 now the first financial year closure date is 31st march of 2023 b private limited company is there 
the date of incorporation is 1st february 2023 now the financial year closure date is 31st march of following financial year that is 31st march of 2024 it's not 31st march 2023 so here you can have 14 months first financial year suppose you know c limited company is there the date of incorporation is exactly 1st january 2023 now date of closure of first financial year is 31st March 2024. So here you can observe 15 months first financial year. 15 months first financial year. And D limited uh, or suppose you know D private limited. There is no change mark for private and public. Just I am giving examples. D private limited incorporated on 31st December 2022. Now financial year closure date would be 31st March of 2023 understood so here you know company was incorporated before 1st january so 31st march of relevant financial year is the closure day i mean is the end of the first financial year so 31st march of 2023 is the last date of first financial year understood everyone everyone so you may ask me sir why what is the reason i'm asking you suppose company was incorporated on 1st january 2023 after incorporation within 30 days, you know, company should have a registered office within 30 days, right? Within 30 days, company should have a registered office and it should file INC 22 with ROC. And, you know, company will enter into uh, contracts that are essential for carrying business operations. And company is required to appoint auditor within 30 days. And the same shall be communicated with ROC within 15 days of appointment of auditor. So if you observe, you know, first three months, you know, if company was incorporated, on or after 1st January, initially one to two months, you know, it won't carry any business operations. Maybe in March month, it is possible, I agree. But you know, only, you know, doing business in the month of March for that one month of business, you know, again, asking company to prepare financial statements under Schedule 3 format, ask auditor to audit the financial statements and call members for a meeting, show the financial performance of the company, get approval from the members. You no, know, just one month business I did. And asking me to comply all these provisions, definitely it is a burden only. Yes or no? And sometimes it is not possible to carry business operations in the first three months. Are you getting my point? So thinking these aspects, you know, a lawman came up with a point stating that if company was incorporated on or after 1st January, then 31st March of relevant year is not the closure date. 31st March of following financial year, financial year would be the closure date of the first financial year. So in that case, you can observe 15 months uh, financial year. This is possible only in the event of first financial year only, not subsequent financial years. Are you getting my point? Now, what is the time limit for conducting first AGM? Time limit for conducting first AGM. So I told you within nine months from the closure of financial year. So simply add nine months. Just add nine months all to this, uh, I mean all the time limits. No, 31st Ma December 2023, 31st December 2024, 31st December 2024, and 31st December 2023. Just now I told you a point. Every company, yearly once, every company, yearly once, they should conduct AGM. Yes or no? What is the general rule? Every company except one person company is required to conduct general meeting yearly once, which is nothing but AGM. But if you observe in these four examples, if you observe in the four, four examples, none of the companies are conducting AGM in the year of incorporation. Just observe it. Just observe it. In the year of incorporation, you know, none of the companies are conducting first AGM. You didn't get my point, right? Just see, ma. Here, what is the year of incorporation in all the cases? Just tell me. A limited 2022. B limited 2023. C limited 2023. D private limited 2022. So, year of incorporation. And just answer my question, you know, in which year company is conducting AGM? In which year company is conducting AGM? So, here it is 2023. Here 2024. C limited 2024. And D private limited 2023. Now observe these two limits. Observe these two years concept. So A limited, which is incorporated in the year 2022, is conducting first AGM in 2023 year. 
2023 calendar year b private limited which was incorporated in in the year 2023 it is conducting first agm in the year of 2024 so to this general rule we are having an exception so no need of conducting agm in the year of incorporation that is the exception what is the general rule every company other than one person company shall conduct general meeting yearly once but coming to the first agm no need to conduct first agm in the year of incorporation that is the concept so right now we completed one time limit ma one time limit that is you know first agm within nine months from the closure of first financial year next one subsequent financial year subsequent financial uh, sorry subsequent agm so here you need to check you know uh, two limits two limits first one within six months from closure of financial year next one time gap between two agms time gap between two annual general meetings shall not exceed shall not exceed 15 months whichever is earlier you need to consider and general rule already i told you every year one agm every year one agm to this general rule we already discussed one exception you know in the year of incorporation no need to have agm and subsequent agm you know you are having two limits within six months from the closure of financial year and the maximum time gap between two agms shall not exceed 15 months let's see due date for subsequent agm you simply answer my questions ma you simply answer my question a limited you know financial year 2022 23 financial year 2021-22 so with respect to financial year 2021-22 they conducted agm exactly on 30 august 2022 so agm date agm date now what is the due date for conducting agm with respect to financial year 2022 and 23 very simple option a option a within six months from closure of financial year closure of financial year you know 31st march 2023 is the closure closure date of financial year just add six months now it is 30th september 2023 you're having second time limit also you know time gap between two agm shall not exceed 15 months the previous agm was conducted on 30th august 2022 just add 15 months now just calculate ma september october november so 30th november 2023 is the due date for conducting a subsequent agm out of these two dates you need to consider earlier one so the earlier one is simply 30th september 2023 so the answer is 30th september 2023 are you all getting my point students everyone and here there is one more uh, one more uh, small privilege is there ma that is that is in case of subsequent agm roc may grant time extension of 3 months so roc is having a power to extend agm due date by 3 months However, this power is not there in case of first agm. With respect to first agm, ROC is not having that power. Only with respect to subsequent agm, ROC is having a power to extend it time up to three months. The first agm, we are giving you sufficient time, you know, nine months. Again, extension, not at all good. Coming to subsequent agm, ROC is having a power to grant a time extension. How much? Three months. For a specific reason, you should. Suppose, you know, Books of accounts are ready, financial statements are ready. But before audit, what happened? Income tax department people came to our premises, they seized all the books of accounts. And you know, after three to four months, you know, they came back and they're telling that, okay, your books are very perfect. Uh, okay, ask your auditor to audit the books. So by the time, you know, I received books of accounts from IT department, the due date is already completed. So, you know, they took all the books of accounts here in the month of May and they handed over to us in the month of October. What I should do? 
So simply write a letter to ROC, sir, uh, because of these reasons, we are unable to conduct AGM within the due date. Please extend the time limit. ROC is having a power to grant time extension up to how many months? You know, up to three months. Are you all getting my point, students? So ROC may grant extension of one month, two months, three months, but more than three months, it is not possible. So with this point, you know, let's have a, one more illustration. One more illustration. B limited company is there. You know, financial year and you know date of uh, AGM. B limited for financial year 2021-22, they conducted AGM on 30th June 2022. Now with respect to financial year 2022-23, calculate the due date of AGM. And here, you know, ROC, you know, it granted time extension. ROC granted time extension for subsequent AGM. How many months, you know, it is two months. Ma. Possible or not possible? Possible. ROC is having power to extend the AGM by three months. They can, they can, they can give you extension of 15 days, 30 days, 45 days, 90 days. But beyond three months, it is not permissible. It is not possible. So it is not within the, it is not in the powers of the ROC. So ROC granted time extension of two months. Now, you know, giving, using these facts, calculate the due date of AGM with respect to financial year 2022-23. Come on, calculate. Option A, within six months from the closure of financial year. Last date of the financial year 2022-23 is 31st March 2023. Add six months you will get 30th september 23 but you need to add two more months no roc granted extension so you add two more months 30th september october november so 30th november 2023 this is first limit second limit 30th june 2022 is the previous agm date add 15 months and again add two months so unfortunately here if you see uh, 30th September, July, August, September, 30th uh, September plus 12 months, 30th September plus 2 months. So 30th November 2023. Unfortunately, you know, both the dates are same. So now the due date for AGM is 30th November 2023. I'm changing the date of AGM, you know, previous AGM date month. Suppose, you know, if it is 31st uh, August 2022, then calculate and tell me the second uh, limit ma. I'll do my own calculation. You go with the, your calculation. So there is no change in option A, but coming to option B. The previous AGM date, it is 31st August 2022. Add 15 plus 2 months. So September, October, November. So 31st January 2024. So out of 31st January 24 and 30th November 2023, whichever is earliest means there is no change. You know, 30th November 2023 is the answer. Is it clear everyone? Everyone. So every year company shall have one AGM. With respect to first AGM, the time limit is within nine months from the closure of uh, first financial year. And with respect to subsequent AGM, so here you are having uh, two time limits. One is within six months from the closure of financial year and the time gap between two AGM shall not exceed 15 months. Is it clear? So with this, you know, time limit for conducting AGM we completed. Next one, we need to discuss uh, relevant provisions with respect to AGM. Ma. Sir, when can I conduct a general meeting? You know, day of AGM. Next, sir. Time, sir. At what time I can call for AGM, sir? You know, at what time I can conduct AGM? At what time I can conduct AGM? Next, uh, place of AGM, sir. At what place I can conduct AGM? So, these are the three different provisions you need to uh, remember. Ma. So, day of AGM. You can have AGM on any day except a national holiday. Except national holiday. We are having a definition to national holiday. Ma. National holiday means a holiday which was declared by central government. Any day declared as a national holiday by central government, we call it as national holiday. The central government is having complete discretionary powers to declare a day as a national holiday. Right now in India, we are having three national holidays. One is January 26th, Republic Day, August 15th, Independence Day, October 2nd, uh, Gandhi Jayanti. So you can conduct AGM on any day except national holiday. So calling general meeting on January 26th, August 15th, this, uh, now October 2nd, 
is uh, you know invalid simply you know void ab initio next one time of agm the commencement time the commencement time simply you know the start time of agm start time of agm it should be during business hours business hours you know lawmaker he gave a meaning to business hours also why because you know business hours means what you think the business time with respect to pub clubs you know they operate only at night times yes or no suppose you know a private limited company carrying a, a business uh, operations like you know clubs or pub pub now is it possible for such company to call for a meeting at night times no 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 not permitted so business hours usually 9 am to 6 pm so the start time of meeting should be between 9 am and 6 pm however you can continue the meeting even after 6 pm also there is no problem but the commencement time the start time so simply the meeting should not start before 9 am the meeting should not start after 6 pm the commencement time of the meeting should be between 9 am and 6 pm next one place of agm place of agm here we are having two options ma general rule we are having two options one is at registered office at registered office you can have a meeting at registered office or or at any place in the city or town or village where a registered office is situated where registered office is situated so you are having two limits at registered office or at any place in the city town village where registered office is situated so you are having only two options you are having only two options at registered office or at any place in the, in the city town village where registered office is situated but you know to the unlisted companies if all the members of company gives consent if all the members of an unlisted company give consent then they can have a meeting at any place in india but general rule you are having only two options registered office Sir, this place is not convenient, sir. Okay, then any place in the city, town, village where registered office is situated. Understood. So these are the general rules with respect to you know day of AGM, time of AGM, and place of uh, AGM. Let's see these provisions in our material, ma. So section ninety six, uh, I think page number twenty two. So I'll cover all these contents. You know, don't worry. So explain the provisions of Companies Act two thousand thirteen regarding first AGM and subsequent AGM. Every company, whether public or private, except OPC, shall hold an AGM every year. Here, year refers to calendar year. Why? Because uh, you know there is no definition of year under Companies Act 2013. Companies Act didn't define what is meant by year. Companies Act defined financial year, but Companies Act didn't define year. So, if any act is not defining a word, then you need to refer such words uh, to General Clauses Act 1897. so general clauses act is simply you know study of general words all the general words which were not defined under various statutes they were they were defined at one place under general clauses act 1897 so as per general clauses act 1897 year means calendar year the start date of year is 1st january and the closure date of year is 31st december understood next one first agm first agm of the company should be held within 9 months from the closing of the first financial year it shall not be necessary for the company to hold any agm in the year of its incorporation yes we discussed this point so no company is required to conduct agm in the year of incorporation subsequent agm subsequent agm of the company should be held within 6 months from the closure of the financial year the maximum gap between two agm should not exceed 15 months extension of validity period of agm in case if it is possible it is not possible for a company to hold an agm within prescribed time the registrar may for any special reason extend the time such extension can be for a period not exceeding 3 months and no such extension of time can be granted by registrar for the holding of the first agm as i already told you first agm you are having a time of 9 months from the closure of financial year first financial year already we are giving you much and more time again extension not possible next d point time and place for holding an agm every agm shall be called during business hours usually between 9 am and 6 pm on any day there is not a national holiday 
So I told you national holiday means and includes a date declared as a national holiday by central government. So every AGM shall be held either at the register office of the company or at some other place within the city, town, village in which the register office of the company is situated. But central government is having a power, it is having a power to grant exemption. So it may exempt any company from the provisions of this subsection subject to such conditions as it may impose. As it may impose. An annual general meeting of an unlisted company may be held at any place in India if consent is given in writing by electronic mode by all the members in advance. Same point I told you. So unlisted company, it can have AGM at any place in India provided all the members should give consent in favor of such proposal in advance. That means before commencement of the meeting. Is it clear? Next one, section 98. Write the powers of the tribunal to call meetings of the members other than AGM. Section 98. So I'll discuss these points with you. Uh, and you know, we had a section 97 also. So just look at the uh, notes, ma. Suppose, you know, I told you every company mandatorily, every company compulsorily should call for AGM. Suppose, you know, board of directors, they're thinking like this, you know, last one year, we didn't started any business. We are in the uh, research and development stage only. So last one year, no sales, no turnover, no net profits. So they are thinking whether AGM is required or not and they come to a conclusion, you know, simply they passed a resolution, board of directors passed a resolution uh, stating that no need to call for AGM this year. No need to call for AGM this year. Excellent, no? I am asking you, is the proposal, is the, is the resolution passed by board of directors valid? No. Why? You know, they are simply opposing companies at 2013. You know, companies said it is very clear that every company whether it is a public or private except OPC shall call for AGM. So we had no exceptions at all to this general rule. We had no exceptions. Now how a board of directors can pass a resolution stating that you know no need to call for a meeting this year. So this board resolution is not correct resolution. This is not a this is not a valid resolution. This is a void ab initio resolution. Are you all getting my point students? Everyone. Everyone, fine. Now, suppose you know, board of directors fail to call for AGM. Then, what is the consequence? Very simple. Any member ma holding us at least one share, if it is a company with the share capital, any person holding a single share is having a power to file an application with the tribunal. So, simply national company law tribunal. So, NCLT after going through the application, you know, it is having a powers. To direct company, so simply ordering company, direct company in calling for AGM, in calling for AGM, or sometimes MCLD directly call for AGM, directly call for AGM. So this is as per provisions of section 97. So NCLD is having a power to call for a AGM or NCLT will direct company in calling for AGM when it received application from the members. So let's see the material ma. section 97. I'll show you first section 97. Mm. So any meeting. Uh, just wait. So okay, section 97 is not there in your syllabus. So the point is, you know, NCLT is having a power to call for a meeting if any application was filed by the members of the company in case company fails to call for AGM that is what section 97 and any meeting called held conducted in accordance with any order made under subsection 1 shall for all the purposes be deemed to be a meeting of the company duly called held and conducted is it clear ma so that is all about 97 now next section you know we'll see uh, 100 you know AGM We'll discuss section 100 EGM, Extraordinary General Meeting. Very small concept. Very, very small concept. The AGM, you know, every year company will conduct a general meeting. We call it as AGM. 
in annual general meeting you can observe that you know company will keep uh, several proposals and members will give approval to the proposals i'm asking you i'm i'm asking you is it possible for a company uh, to take all the decisions at agm only is it possible for the members of the company to take all decisions at uh, agm only sometimes possible sometimes impossible suppose you know suddenly we received a central government order order rectifying the name so it issued order in the month of december you now september we completed agm december we received a notice from government stating that change the name change your name now i'm asking you students you know just just option you know do you think company will answer to the government like this you know company hey central government Three months back, I conducted AGM. Next AGM will be conducted in the month of September. So wait for nine months. You just wait for nine months. I'll call members and I'll, I'll take their approval to modify the name of the company. So I'm asking you, you know, matters like emergency matters. Example, you know, change of name because of central government direction. So is it possible to wait till the next AGM? No. So depending on emergency. you need to call for a general meeting and this general meeting is other than agm and this is the general meeting which which happens between two annual general meetings this is nothing but extraordinary general meeting so any general meeting other than agm we call it as extraordinary general meeting are you getting my point so in the month of january or you know in the month of december you know directors will call for uh, agm members will attend the agm and members will pass appropriate resolution so simply egm today gained importance only due to emergency of uh, matters urgency of decisions clear everyone fine so now this egm may be called by board of directors on suo moto basis you know on their own motion on their own motion suppose you know shifting of register office from one city to another city the board of directors want to shift company register office from one city to another city in the month of january now they need to get approval from the members before shifting so simply in the month of january they need to get approval from the members so obviously directors will call for egm in the month of january or december so board of directors on suo moto powers they can call for egm the next one by the board of directors egm may be called by board of directors because of requisition by requisitionist so there is a demand from requisitionist so requisition is nothing but a demand it's an application letter which contains a demand so you know certain members certain members demanding the directors to call for egm in order to discuss some emergency matters and you know egm may be called by requisitionist themselves a requisitionist themselves you now if board fails to call meeting then requisitionist themselves can call for egm and sometimes egm may be called by nclt also nclt also so all these three situations were covered under section 100 ma and this one covered under section 98 egm by nclt So EGM by board of directors on so motto EGM by board of directors based on requisition by requisition is EGM by requisition is themselves EGM by requisition is and EGM by NCLT so if EGM is called by board of directors on so motto basis is simply you know if board of directors are making a call for EGM in that case you know the protocols like date time place date time place of general meeting no need to follow the above protocols simply you can conduct annual general sorry you can conduct egm on any day including national holiday any day so there is some emergency there is some emergency to resolve that emergency situation or to get approval on emergency basis you know again asking them don't conduct egm on the national holiday don't conduct egm before 9 after 6 pm don't conduct agm at any place other than register office or at any place other than a city town village where register office is situated so don't keep these restrictions give them some freedom so time any time including non business hours place any place in india 
any place in India. So let's see the material ma. Explain the provisions of Companies Act regarding EGM. All general meetings other than annual general meetings are called extraordinary general meetings. Who can call EGM? Board of Directors. The board may, whether it deems fit, call an extraordinary general meeting of the company. An EGM of the company other than of wholly owned subsidiary of a company incorporated outside India shall be held at any place within India. So here we are having a small provision ma wholly incorporated sorry a company which is wholly owned subsidiary to a company incorporated outside India. Let's decode the rule. So here we are having two companies ma company you know uh, which is incorporated in India and this is wholly owned subsidiary to a company incorporated outside India outside India simply this is a foreign company and it is doing business with the help of Indian company okay fine so not a foreign company ma just you know I am telling you for your understanding I am telling you foreign company but foreign company means a company incorporated outside India and having a place of business in India so yes uh, there are two companies ma company incorporated outside India wholly owned subsidiary means you know 100% of share capital of the Indian company was held by a company incorporated outside India now this is the situation so suppose you know a limited is there uh, this was incorporated uh, in australia and it is holding 100 percent uh, paid up share capital of uh, c limited now uh, which is indian company so now c limited is the wholly owned subsidiary to a limited wholly owned subsidiary to a limited now in case of c limited if they want to call for egm this egm can be conducted at any place even in india outside india why because you know 100 percent of capital was held by a person you know he's a non-resident first of all and moreover it is not a citizen at all you know company is not a citizen ma. so it is a you know it is a company incorporated outside india that means you know 100 percent ownership lies with the person who was not a citizen to india or not a resident to india so in case of emergency situations no need to come to india no need to conduct egm you can have egm in Australia only you can have EGM at any place in India or at any place outside India so a company which is a wholly owned subsidiary to a company incorporated outside India they can have EGM at any place in India as well as outside India so except to this company all other companies they can conduct EGM at any place within India and specified IFSC private companies and uh, uh, IFSC public companies, the board may subject to consent of all the shareholders convene its EGM at any place either within India or outside India. So the primary requirement is consent of all the members. With the consent of all the members, they can have EGM at any place either within India or outside India. Are you all getting my point students? Everyone. So next one so they already discussed on any day except national holiday it's for agm agm any day any day next one on the requisition of members requisition of members the requisition you know it may be request or demand so certain members you know they are asking the board of directors to call for egm so you know members came to know some confidential information about the managing director the managing director is continuously participating in some illegal activities is manipulating company funds is investing all the funds in some illegal activities like that you know certain members came to know this fact now these members want to call for a meeting want to uh, want to conduct a meeting so simply these members are asking the directors to call for a meeting so in that meeting they want to pass a resolution with respect to removal of managing director removal of managing director so generally you know board of directors are having authority to call for the meeting except board of directors none of the persons are will have authority to call for the meeting the board of directors are having supremacy supreme authority in calling for general meeting so that's why you know members members is having a right to file requisition with uh, directors directors so here you need to uh, we need to discuss some rules with respect to requisition ma not all requisitions are valid ma only few requisitions no members they will file requisition with company 
requisition with company so these members should satisfy some conditions suppose you know if they are members to the company with the share capital in that case these members either individually or jointly individually or jointly they must have not less than one tenth of paid up share capital and they are entitled to vote they should be entitled to vote on date of receipt of requisition date of receipt of requisition if members belong to a company without share capital without share capital then you know they should satisfy a condition you know they should have at least one tenth of total voting power of company and uh, they are entitled to vote on the date of receipt of requisition are you all getting my point you know one condition is common there should be they are entitled to vote at the meeting and they are entitled to vote as on date of receipt of requisition by the company the change in condition is if it is a company with share capital then you know one tenth of total paid up share capital of the company if it is a company without share capital then one tenth of total voting power of the company so while satisfying i mean satisfying these conditions you know members should file a requisition with company simply you know that requisition should be signed by the persons holding not less than one tenth of total paid up share capital in case of company with share capital or you know not less than one tenth of total voting power in case of company without share capital so these people should sign the requisition now you know company received this requisition now what is the duty on the company you know what is the duty on the board of directors very simple within 21 days of within 21 days of date of receipt of requisition i repeat within 21 days of date of receipt of requisition you know company today it received requisition from today onwards you know within 20 days it should call for egm call for egm initiate all the things in calling for egm and within 45 days within 45 days of date of receipt of requisition conduct egm conduct egm the total the company is having 45 days time limit in completing the egm when it is demanded by requisitionist so members filing requisition we call them as requisitionist and board of directors you know within 21 days of date of receipt of requisition they should call for egm and that meeting should be conducted within 45 days you may get a doubt sir suppose you know if board of directors fail to call for meeting within 21 days or fail to conduct meeting within 45 days of date of receipt of requisition then what is the consequence sir very simple now you know the power to call for general meeting this power gets transferred from board of directors to requisitionist requisitionist if board fails to call for egm within 21 days or if board fails to conduct egm within 45 days then power shall be transmitted to requisitionist so where you know requisition is within 90 days simply you know within three months from the date of requisition within three months from the date of requisition uh, the requisitionist should call for egm and this egm should be conducted so there is no time limit for calling for general meeting ma but this egm should be conducted within three months from the date of a requisition so that is case three coming to the case three you know if meeting is called by requisition is they can conduct egm at any on any day except national holiday any day except national holiday remember these rules sir what is the time for meeting sir any time during business hours any time between 9 am and 6 pm and place of general meeting so you are having two options one is register office and the second one is uh, any place in city town village where registered office is situated so that means the rules with respect to agm and the rules with respect to egm by requisition is or one and the same is it clear so what is the time limit for conducting egm by requisition is three months from the date of requisition and the requisition is valid only if it is signed by the members either individually or jointly you know holding 
वन टेंथ ऑफ नॉट लेस दैन वन टेंथ ऑफ टोटल पेड अफ शेयर कैपिटल इनकेस ऑफ कंपनी विथ शेयर कैपिटल एंड यू नो वन टेंथ ऑफ वोटिंग पावर टोटल वोटिंग पावर ऑफ द कंपनी इनकेस ऑफ कंपनी विदउट शेयर कैपिटल अंडरस्टूड लेट्स सी द रूल्स ऑन द रिक्वेस्ट रिसिप्ट ऑफ रिक्वेजिशन हू कैन मेक अ वैलिड रिक्वेजिशन इन द केस ऑफ कंपनी हैविंग अ शेयर कैपिटल सच नंबर ऑफ मेंबर्स Who hold on the date of receipt of requisition at least one tenth of such paid-up share capital of the company as on that date carries the right of voting. And in case of company not having a share capital, such number of members who hold on the date of receipt of requisition at least one tenth of total voting power of all the members having on the said date a right to vote. So they should have voting rights as on date of receipt of requisition. You know when company is getting the requisition. on that date on that said date these people should have voting rights next one explain the provisions of company rules 2014 regarding egm by requisition is you know rule 17 the members may requisition convening of an egm in accordance with section 100 sub section 4 by providing such requisition in writing or through electronic mode at least uh, clear 21 days prior to the proposed date of such egm i told you that meeting should be conducted within 3 months from date of requisition so they should propose a date you now this is the date of egm so for the propose to the proposed date at least 21 days before at least 21 days before they should send notice calling for egm notice is nothing but intimation i'll discuss this concept on the section 101 don't worry the notice shall specify the place of uh, egm date of egm day of egm and hour of the meeting and shall contain the business to be transacted at the meeting simply the decisions business means not you know buy and sell business is nothing but decisions to be taken at the meeting a requisition is should convene a meeting uh, either at register office or in the same city or town where register office is situated and such meeting should be convened on any day except national holiday i told you right if the re resolution is to be proposed as a special resolution the notice shall be given as required under section 114 So keep this point pending. I'll discuss this point under section one fourteen. The notice shall be signed by all the requisitionists or by requisitionists duly authorized. Suppose you know if three persons are authorizing the if three persons are authorizing the AGM, three people can sign the notice. Suppose three hundred people are there. Now three hundred people can't sign the notice, right? So on behalf of three hundred people, you know one authorized person will sign the notice by all other requisitionists on their behalf. Or by sending an electronic request attaching there with a scanned copy of such duly signed requisition, and here no explanatory statement is required under section one or two explanatory statement. So simply the statement which contain an information, a detailed information with respect to the decision. Simply no justification. Explanatory statement will contain a justification. Okay, so for EGM conducted by requisition is. this explanatory statement section 1 or 2 is not required so no need to comply with the provisions of section 1 or 2 so detailed discussion about explanatory statement will be given under section 1 or 2 don't worry of the notice of agm convened by requisitionist and requisitionist may disclose the reasons you know here may optional simply if they want they may disclose the reasons for the resolutions but it is not mandatory which they propose to move at the meeting The notice of the meeting shall be given to those members whose names appear in the register of members of the company within three days on which requisition is deposit with company a valid requisition for calling the EGM. So yes, general doubt ma. The point is, EGM generally you know the details of the members. You know directors will contain the data. Direct sorry, directors will have the data with respect to the details of the members. If board of directors fail to call for EGM based on the requisition, then who can conduct EGM? requisitionist so requisitionist should give notice to all other members so who are the members of the company the data is available with the directors so directors should give details of the members to the requisitionist now requisitionist will forward notices to the persons whose name appear in the register of members now within 3 days that means you know directors are having 3 days time period to update register of members Sir, updation of register of members means what? See, in a company, shares are freely transferable, ma. In private company, subject to restrictions, that transferable. Now the question is, when shares are keeping on transferred, so there will be change in the status of member. So today I am the member. Tomorrow I may I may not be the member because you know today night, today evening I may sell all my shares. 
so here you know the register of members should be updated within three days and uh, that persons whose names appear in the register of members you know to all these people requisitionists will send a notice calling for meeting whether meeting is not convened where the meeting is not convened the requisitionist shall have a right to receive list of members together with the registered address number of shares held and company concerned is bound to give list of members together with the registered address made as on 21st day from the date of receipt of valid requisition together with such changes if any before the expiry of 45 days from the date of receipt of a valid requisition so the meaning of the point is date of receipt of requisition suppose you know i'm sending the notice i'm sending the requisition over email over email now today i'm sending this requisition today only company will receive the requisition so date of requisition date of receipt of requisition imagine both are on a single day so from here onwards within 21 days the board of directors should call for meeting call for meeting and from date of receipt of requisitions you know within 45 days 45 days egm shall be conducted suppose board fail to call for meeting within 21 days or board fails to conduct egm within 45 days then from date of requisition onwards within three months within three months within three months EGM can be conducted by requisitioners. This is the provision, right? The requisitionist shall forward the notice to whom? To the persons whose details appear in the register of members, you know, which should be updated within three days from the date of receipt of requisition. And this register of members, this register should be made available, you know, between 21 to 45 days. You know, board of directors after the expiry of 21 days, but before expiry of 45 days, you know, board of directors should hand over this register of members copy to requisitionist you may get a doubt sir why board of directors will give register of members register to the requisitionist sir i agree with you in that case you know requisitionist it is impracticable to them to call for egm so requisitionist will straight away go to nclt sir sir we are planning to conduct egm but company is opposing egm company is not pro providing support to us board of directors are not giving the details of the members board of directors are not calling for egm so like this you know requisitionist uh, is having an option to consult nclt now nclt under section 98 98 will call for egm understood the notice of the meeting shall be given by speed post or registered post or through electronic mode and any accidental omission you know omission which was not deliberate it is not intentional you know unintentional omission we prepared notice we send the notice but you know accidentally it got omitted or non receipt of such notice by any member shall not invalidate the proceedings of the meeting that means you know meeting will be valid so simply quite opposite you know quite opposite if you ask me the provision quite opposite to this uh, point that is you know the notice of the meeting if it is omitted accidentally then all the proceedings at the meeting all the proceedings at the meeting shall be void are you all getting my point shall be void understood my dear students so with this you know egm by requisition is to be completed we need to discuss egm by nclt see for any reason if it is impracticable just now i gave one example to call a meeting of a company other than agm in any manner in which meetings of the company may be called or to be held or conduct the meeting of the company in the manner prescribed by this act or articles of association of the company suppose you know there is a, a meeting is required but some reasons impracticable reasons it is impossible for us to call for a meeting then the tribunal may either sue a motu or an application by the director or an application by the member of the company would be entitled to vote at the meeting in that situation the tribunal can order a meeting of the company to be called held conducted in such manner as tribunal thinks fit and it can give ancillary directions consequential directions as tri tribunal thinks expedient including directions modifying supplementing in relation to calling holding conducting of the meeting the operation of the provisions of this act or articles of the company suppose you know as per the act 21 days notice should be given 
ट्वेंटी वन डेज नोटिस मीन नॉट गिविंग नोटिस ऑन ईच एंड एवरी डे फॉर ट्वेंटी वन डेज इट्स नॉट लाइक दट द टाइम गैप बिटवीन नोटिस ऑफ मीटिंग यू नो पोस्ट ऑफ नोटिस एंड डेट ऑफ मीटिंग शुड बी मिनिमम ट्वेंटी वन डेज ट्वेंटी वन डेज एंड बोर्ड ऑफ डायरेक्टर्स आर हैविंग पावर टू कॉल फॉर जनरल मीटिंग दीज आर जनरल रूल्स बट ट्रिब्यूनल इज हैविंग अ पावर टू एक्सम्प्ट ऑल दीज रूल्स ट्रिब्यूनल सिंपली बाई गिविंग अ नोटिस यस कंपनी शुड कॉल फॉर अ मीटिंग सर माई आर्टिकल्स ऑफ एसोसिएशन इज लाइक दिस सर You know, provisions of Companies Act is like this, sir. Yeah, forget about them. Now, whatever I am telling you, you need to follow. And such directions may include a direction that one member of the company present in person or by proxy shall be deemed to constitute a, a meeting. So generally, meeting require how many parties? Two. Meeting require how many parties? Two. However, when tribunal is calling for a meeting, even if one person attends the meeting, that meeting is valid only. That meeting is valid only. understood so in detail i'll discuss this concept under section 1 or 3 quorum proxy simply representative of the member i'll discuss this point under section 1 or 5 you'll understand this chapter only when i complete this chapter so initially don't think that uh, by listening to first class i should get all the provisions of this management and administration not possible just wait for uh, you know couple of hours you'll get total clarity next one punishment section 99 provides that if any default is made in holding a meeting of the company or in complying with the directions of the tribunal the company and every officer in default every officer of the company who is in default shall be punishable with fine which may extend to 1 lakh in case of continuing default punishment will be in addition of fine which may extend to 5000 for every day during which such default continues very simple to remember for violation of this provision first you know fixed penalty up to 1 lakh and you know continuous default Then each day five thousand, five thousand per day extra. First of all, you need to conduct general meeting by thirtieth September two thousand twenty-three. Ma, first thing, you violated this uh, time limit. You know you are conducting AGM on tenth October two thousand twenty-three without uh, getting approval from ROC. Now, first of all, you violated section ninety-six, and you know the default is of ten days. You can observe continuous default of ten days. You can observe. Now fixed penalty up to one lakh plus each day five thousand rupees like that you know ten days five thousand into ten days fifty thousand rupees fifty thousand rupees so this is the penalty to the company as well as every officer in default understood understood everyone so with respect to this you know we completed the time limits for conducting AGM as well as AGM so in next class. we'll discuss all the prerequisites for calling general meeting so so far what we covered in this class ma time limit for conducting agm and you know requisites of you know day time place of general meeting and then agm by nclt next one agm agm by board of directors agm by board of directors uh, so motto next one based on requisition by the requisition is next one requisition is and agm by nclt and then punishment for violation of section 96 9798 understood so with this i conclude this uh, class next class we'll discuss uh, we'll we'll start discussion from question number 1 onwards fine take a small break and watch next lecture